my time at Barclays was very short lived. I was there at, for about six months. Um, that was quick. Yeah, it was really quick. I hated the job. I hated the colleagues. And it was just, uh, yeah, I, I don't. They're going to see this. Huh? They're going to see this. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll post the podcast to, to them. But I'll let them know about the podcast. Beat stars, the foundation, the precedence. We flying flags in every city, global residence. And we killing off the masters. Ghetto slave driving bastards. We making hits faster than you could think. We're on the brink of revolution. All my indie music makers, here's your restitution. Uh, we got the game in a chokehold. Not paying the creators is a no no. I got the smoke road for all the fam. What's up, everybody? It's A Batch on the CEO of Beat Stars, and this is Pay the Creators podcast on Beat Stars. Another great episode here uh, in Amsterdam. We got to link up with, I'm going I'm to call him the king of chill. He doesn't know it. He doesn't, I mean, he, maybe he, he's never been called that, but to me, he's the king of chill beats. He's a top three, top five selling producer on the, in the history of the internet. We're sitting today with an absolute legend straight out of Liverpool, UK, my guy, GC Beats. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Abe. Thanks for having me. It's How good to be you, here. Thanks for um, coming. Doing pretty we didn't well. get a round of applause or nothing, man. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> That's more like it. <laughs> GC Beats, man. The king of chill. Um, and also, I got a, another co-host. We had Lee on the other one. I got my guy, attorney Kyle, legal associate over at Beat Stars, man. Helping the people. Helping the people. Um, it's been it's been fun, man. Like coming out to, to ADE has been a pretty cool you know, experience, music experience, just taking in all the energy, all the creative energy. Um, how has your experience been here so far? It's been really good. Um, very fast paced. So I got here on the 17th, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, but already I've been to so many events and it's actually my first time in ADE. Um, I'm sure I'm going to be back next year. Hell yeah, man. No, it, we appreciate you coming out taking the time to sit down with us. I know you don't, you didn't have to do that in, in between, you know, all the crazy raves you've been going, you've been going to. Hey, I, I, don't, I don't know how many more of them I can take, to be honest. But, <laughs> nah, yeah. it's dope, man. Um, man, so we, we, we spoke a little bit last week and um, your, your journey and your story is just, just so amazing. Um, especially like some of the things that you had to do to like give up in terms of, you know, um, to become this like full-time creator and do your thing. You, you know, you had to sacrifice a lot, but um, would love to just have you just walk us through a little bit um, of your journey, kind of recap what we talked about last week, but you know, how did you get into music in the first place? You know, what, what age did you start? Was there an instrument that you picked up? Like how did, what was your, what was your first introduction into making music? Um, so as far back as I can remember, it was from, I was just a kid, maybe like three, four years old. And I remember my mom bought me this toy keyboard. So it's like smaller than some of the smallest mini controllers out there on the market today. I think it was about 15 keys. And um, at the time it was pretty good. You could, um, it had a, had a lot of pre-built sounds in, you know, octave control. You could record for a couple of seconds, which was huge at the time. Um, but I just got, um, messing around with that keyboard and what I used to do was create, recreate the melodies of certain cartoons and films that I'd see on TV and also songs from my brother's uh, favorite CD, uh, CD collections and uh, play that back to him. So that, that was when I thought, you know, maybe, well, actually, I, you wouldn't think I'd have a knack for music at that age. I didn't know anything then. I was yeah. just like playing, playing on this little toy keyboard, but that's where it all started for me. Yeah. That's yeah. dope, man. You, you were saying um, you you were like recreating some some cartoons and stuff. What do you, do you remember? Like, what was the first cartoon that you you recreated? I don't know. So in the UK, we had this um, this show or this channel called Cartoon Network. Oh yeah, we got so, it. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that what you guys have? Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, I don't know. I don't can't remember um, shows like I don't know, Cow and Chicken, Tom mm. and Jerry, mm -hmm. just like all these classic cartoons that I grew up with, and. Um, yeah, so what I used to do was just recreate these top, like the melodies of these mm -hmm. opening themes, and that would be like, I don't know, quite cool to me. Yeah, yeah. that's dope, man. Like, during the early days of you, like, creating music, 
um, what, 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 what would you think was like the biggest, uh, obstacle that you faced, um, you know, in throughout the whole journey? Like, what, what do you think was the hardest part? Um, as in since, since I dis has discovered music as a child or now, uh, in this. Yeah. Maybe like the early days of your, like, you know, as a creator. Uh, um, I think first learning to play an instrument, like I didn't know what to, to do after, well, without any sort of formal music education. I didn't have any lessons as a kid, but I wanted to, it was hard to figure out what I wanted to play in terms of an instrument to um, get things started. Um, so uh, when I reached 12 years old, uh, that was when I started taking drum lessons mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, from so there, drums, it, it got a lot easier. Sure. Yeah, I started learning how to play keys mm -hmm. a couple of years after I got into production, but it was just figuring out that first step into what I would do after, uh, yeah, getting that toy keyboard I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just want to know, like, when you were growing up, like, what were some of your influences? Like, because I was watching, the, we're kind of around the same age, and I was watching, like, Tom and Jerry, and yeah. um, one of my favorites was Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah, <laughs> um, and it used to scare me a lot, bro. That was a that was a very trippy show. Like some of the concepts in that, like you wouldn't understand as even as an adult, you wouldn't understand to this I day. Know, I know it was like yeah. that was like a huge part of my childhood, and music was too, right? Mm. So, like I wonder back then, like when you were that age, I um, mean, you were discovering like your love for music. What type of music was I like, was inspiring you? Like, what was you listening to? What was what was in GC's like playlist back then? Yeah, uh, well, it was, remember I was talking about my brother's CD collection. Mm -hmm. So it was mainly um, albums from there. So um, I had this, I think, at the Marshall Mothers EP. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually on cassette. Uh, but at the time I was listening to that. Um, uh, it, at a very young age, you know, yeah, it was very explicit. And I was like, yo, this is kind of, kind of like heavy on the ears like I didn't he was like really Eminem was really aggressive back in the day mm -hmm. um but that's kind of like how I got into listening to the rap genre what would you um, say back then your favorite your favorite outside of that album what would you say um your favorite album growing up as a child what would that be um <laughs> I know that's a hard I question know. yeah I can't really remember to be honest um Or favorite song? Yeah. Uh, um, I used to listen to Blink One Eight Two. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was playing on the radio a lot. Um, I guess that was also my introduction into like pop rock, live mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But. I remember you telling uh, you tell me that um, <clears throat> you, you did mention like the Drake era, the Migos, the uh, chance the rapper era as like inspirations, you know? So you feel like, does your, like as a creator, does your inspiration stop? You know, it doesn't like stop with, you know, the, the folks that you used to listen to. Are you constantly like continuing to kind of mold your, your influences as, as music continues to grow? Um, yes. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's kind of weird because as a producer, um, you don't really have, well, I don't really have time to listen to any new music. I'm always focused on creating. So um, as of late, I, I've not really um, discovered any new artists, but um, back then I'd used to go on SoundCloud and mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. uh, look at all these like new independent artists. And that's when I would discover things that were outside, like, uh, songs and uh, genres that were outside of the box and yeah. that really inspired me yeah a lot of people come up to me and ask me hey you know you're in the music industry who's your who's your favorite artist who's, who's you know who you listening to the most and people don't believe me the last 15 years i've just been listening to beats on beat stars you know i yeah. get locked in and just kind of there's just so much damn good music on the platform that mm -hmm. i feel like if i'm going to listen to music it, i'd be doing myself like a disservice if i'm not you know mm. listening to the community because what's crazy is I'll, I'll listen to stuff. And then six months later or like a year later, it becomes the main mainstream sound. I remember when lo-fi was, didn't even have a name, 
you know, mm -hmm. in those, yeah. those early days of lo-fi on, on beat stars, you know, um, same thing with a lot of like chill, chill pop stuff that you do. Like you were doing that so many years before it became like a real YouTube phenomenon, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or like, you know, it, 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 it's cool that you guys are actually like setting the trends, but I wanted to go back <clears throat> cause we were talking about your educational journey, you know? Yeah. And I'd love to just have you just bring up a little bit about, you know, your, your educational path and, and where, where did that, where did that lead you into? Um, so I started off, well, I started off doing, um, uh, accounting and finance in university. But I remember before, before then you said uh, you were, um, in the art school, right? Oh yeah, that's right. So, yeah. uh, if it's, if it's related to music, then yeah, yeah. yeah I attended a, the, the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did a diploma in popular music and sound tech. Mm. Um, but prior to that, I just, you know, went through the whole formal education okay. system, um, high school, college. Um, and that was after that I did the diploma, but then I completely, I did the, did a 180 and did something completely unrelated to music, um, at university. And that was the accounting and finance, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. bachelor's, uh, degree. Um, so. Uh, that, I guess that's where my education sort of ended. Yeah, that's my highest level of education that I had. Yeah, so you went you went into a whole a whole different field, you know, than than the music with your accounting and finance, and then you ended up, you know, working in that field, right? Working working in in that while you were kind of making beats. Yeah, um, yeah. So I was working for Barclays, the um, yep. you know, Barclays Bank. I was actually a uh, doing uh, the mortgage uh, mortgages, mm -hmm. uh, but that was very short lived. Uh, you know, at the during that time, I was making beats. I started making beats and uploading them to Beat Stars. Um, yeah, yeah. Talk us through that. Talk us through that like pivotal moment. You know, with you, um, like living between these two worlds of, you know, corporate America, corporate UK, <laughs> I'll say corporate America, yeah. Sorry, corporate America is everywhere actually, but, <laughs> they uh, <hear> now. <laughs> yeah. but you know, um, living in the corporate world yeah. and, you know, trying to figure out if that is going to be your career path, but you know, in the, in the back of your brain, you're just, you know, determined to be this musician that, you know, yeah. wouldn't accept. I just love, love to hear like, the, the moment that led up to that pivotal moment for you to kind of stop working in that field and then just doing what you're doing full time. Yeah. Um, so like I say, my time at Barclays was very short lived. I was there at, for about six months. Um, that was quick. Yeah. It was really quick. I hated the job. I hated <laughs> the colleagues. And it was just, uh, yeah, I, I don't. They're going to see this. Huh? They're going to see this. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll post the podcast to, to them. <laughs> I'll let them know about the podcast. No, um, but um, it's a cold world. It's a cold. It's a cold world. You know, it is. Um, I didn't. You know, when you go into this sort of environment and it's very bland and the office is all grey, mm -hmm. you slow. You very quickly you find out. You know, it's not something that I want to do long term. Um, but as I say, I was uploading beats to Beat Stars at that uh, during that year, twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. Um, in the later half, I think around about December. Uh, that month I uh, made, uh, in terms of income, I broke even as the can So like my beat sales, the income from that was, um, uh, the same, the same, if not more than what I was earning on my, for my salary mm -hmm. at Barclays. So that was, that was when I thought, you know, I'd take a chance. Took off your apron and, and just. Yeah. <laughs> I just completely, you know, drop out. Yeah. I'm out kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You give them at least two weeks. Um, I did have to give them notice <laughs> yeah. just for, you know, you know what the whole workplace etiquette is like, but if I had a choice, looking back now, if I knew, you know, I'd, this is what I'd be like today, I'd probably just be like, see you later. I'm off. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Like how, how liberating did that feel, man? To be like, shit, oh man, like I'm, people are investing in my music to mm. the point where I can 
work from home, have the freedom and just like, what, 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 it, what it, did you think it was going to be a long-term thing? Or you thought, I mean, that was pretty quick. Like you just, that first month you made, yeah. you made the equivalent of that, you know, your salary, you just, that's it. You were all in. Yeah. Did you, did you just know inside that that was going to be like a long-term yeah. thing for you? Well, that's how I felt at that time. Exactly how I felt. So when I seen the numbers, I thought it's, you know, I, like I said, I'm out. I've got to give this an opportunity, give myself an opportunity. But uh, it was more kind of like the the metrics and like the doing the math in my head kind of thing. So like like I said to, uh, I was saying to Mike Trump, um, there's no, there, there was no business plan for, for me in terms of, you know, how I'm going to go, go into beat making and sustain myself as, mm -hmm. well, as a business. Uh, it was just, if I can sell X amount of beats per day, per month, for, for a whole year, then this is, you know, this is the potential to, for, for, for earnings. Um, yeah. And yeah, that, that kind of like made me more confident in leaving my job. No. I guess my question also would be, um, I think about sometimes like I start off as a rapper and I had to kind of make the decision of stay a rapper or pursue like my profession in law. And I thought it was going to be a path where um, they split and went in a different direction. But fortunately, I started buying beats off of Beatstars as a rapper, right? And then my passions came back together. And I think a lot of like young creators don't always understand that we it's a world where we can do both sometimes. Mm. You know, a lot of times people make you feel like you got to pick one or the other. When in, in, in the end, you kind of end up doing both. So... Maybe talk a little bit about like how you were able to mix your passion. Um, well, not, I wouldn't call it a passion, but your understanding and knowledge of like finance. And I know we talked about this the other day, but yeah. like your knowledge of finance with your skill of being a creator and like how do you think, mm -hmm. you know, understanding finance has helped you, you know, not only, you know, grow your skill as a creator, but also just grow a business. Yeah. Um, well, the majority of producers, including myself, are self employed. Mm -hmm. And, um, we run our own comp um, limited companies, so it's it was useful to have accounting and finance as as a skill and the knowledge from the degree the degree that I did in terms of having to you know do things like file taxes or at least understand how in the income is coming in and expenses going out. But it also made uh, talking to my accountant a lot easier when it came to um, you know year end taxes and uh, that really helped my beat, uh, beat business run a lot more smoothly. Yeah. Also, also too, to build off of that, right? When you say like, we were talking about this on um, the other night, but can you talk a little bit about like how you track just certain things. Like well, if I'm a young creator and, you know, I want to make sure like I'm tracking, you know, things that are doing well, tracking my income, you know, for my business, you know, monitoring what's coming in. What are some tips, maybe finance tips or advice you would give them of the things that they should be tracking to to know like how their business is going to do or what's not good or what people are gravitating to? Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, uh, to be honest, I only use, uh, so like when we make sales on PayPal, and, uh, well, what used to be Stripe, mm -hmm. um, I would just, I wouldn't really look at the data and uh, kind of an analyze it. I would just use it purely for, you know, keeping doing the books and uh, getting that across to my accountant. So, I guess, gotcha. yeah, that's all I would. But did you ever like, you know, you know, um, when you, a lot of, you know, just talking with anyway well and just and Yahor and talking about how, you know, all businesses take an investment, you know, to grow. Yeah. When you first started seeing those early like you know signals of success with beat sales or just plays or youtube views and you start seeing okay there's there's I, there's some engagement happening looks like i'm garnering an audience people are interested in my music did you like stop and think okay all right if i'm going to take this thing seriously from a business perspective i'm going to budget this much for this i'm going to invest in this or did you always kind of just reinvest from your earnings or did you invest, you know, initially to kind of, you know, build your business up 
prior to like the earnings reaching a certain um, amount? Um, that's uh, so actually my mom helped invest into my business. So oh. she bought me my first pair of monitors. I remember asking her for that um, uh, because at the time I didn't, I didn't have any money. Um, and she was uh, very, uh, very kind as to say, you know, yes. And she bought me my first set of you know, the monitors, the audio interface. The only thing I had was my laptop. But um, uh, initially that it was a very small kind of, I, I guess, like, amount of capital needed to set up as a producer. Um, uh, and, the, but you know, it's, it's, that's the good thing about it. Like you don't have to put so much money into getting set up, but results can be big if you put the work in and the hours in. Yeah, for sure. Did you feel like early on you were, you know, reinvesting a lot more than, you know, um, than you were kind of like taken out as income for yourself to kind of keep building the business? Um, no, I was just focused on making beats on the daily. Um, I didn't really spend that much money to other than what I had borrowed off my mom. It's, yeah. yeah, it was very simple. It was just- You're one of the lucky yeah, ones. So. Yeah, you're one of the lucky ones. And I, I think we have to make it very clear, I think to a lot of like younger creators that not everyone gets to just upload a beat and see success. You know, there's, there's different, let's be real, there's different levels to this shit. And I think the amount of, um, work that you put into actually creating your own niche lane um, of music and sound helped, helped you, you know, differentiate yourself in a way where you're, you're really like creating targeting marketing without really having to do targeting marketing, just letting your sound speak for itself. And I think a lot of producers um, get stuck with, you know, like creating the trending sound you know, mm. creating the trending sound and you've, you've carved out your own lane in a, in a way, you know, mm. um, that doesn't really exist that much on B stars. And I'm still surprised, right? I'm still surprised. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, maybe a few, a few, a few producers that kind of are trying to, trying to not mimic, but, you know, kind of create com complementary music to what, to what you're making. But, um, do you feel like, was that a, cause you're saying you used to listen to Eminem, used to listen to hardcore rap. And, um, you know, you, you didn't come out the gates that way though, in terms of like your own sound, you know, do you feel like, was that a strategy that you're like, okay, I'm going to, there's not a lot of folks creating in this lane. I'm going to attack this lane and see where it goes in terms of like keyword strategy, in terms of just sound and genre. Yeah. Was that something that you initially, you know, strategize with or that just happened on accident? No, it was uh, completely, totally unplanned. Um, but I, I believe it was like a culmination of everything that I, I listened to as, as a kid. Um, you know, I was exposed to a lot of different genres mm -hmm. and a, a lot of the songs I still remember um, uh, going up to my teens as well. So that that's had a lot. I think I believe that's had a lot to do in terms of uh, inspiration. Um, but when it comes to actually producing these beats, um, yeah, I, I didn't want to box myself in. Mm -hmm. And I like to, um, I, I like to make beats as I go along. I don't, I don't have, everything needs to be a blank canvas. You know, every project, every session mm. needs to be a blank canvas. And I just produce what comes to my mind mm. uh, on that particular day. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. So you were talking about, you were talking about just your journey, right? And going from working in finance to, oh, I got enough money. I can kind of transition full time and do music, but maybe talk a little bit about to the young creators that's watching this, the value of having catalog, right? Like what is the value to you of what freedom does having catalog provide you? What, what advantages have, you know, having that catalog like allowed you to do, you know, differently in life? Um, you know, maybe, then, maybe then some of your peers that, we're on a similar path or a different path. What has having ownership in a catalog like afforded you the, the ability to do? Um, when you say catalog, do you mean ca uh, like a, just a beat catalog or does that include kind of, you know, songs and that you have under your belt? Well, we can start with the beat catalog, like just having, having a, um, a great catalog of beats that's, you know, constantly kind of like real estate, right? Always working, always generating yeah. something for you. 
Yeah. Uh, well, that's what I, that's what I was about to say. So it was actually you that said it. Um, I seen on Instagram like having there was a post that you posted, or I think the Beat Stars publishing account, and it was like um, uh, every piece of music that you put out, or whether it's a beat or a song, is is like a you know real estate, and from that you can get you know interest. You know, interest it would be like kind of the publishing that you would uh, be earning on it, but um, that's a very important part of um, being a producer or an artist is um, making sure that you uh, build your catalog consistently and to the best quality that it can be so that you can uh, kind of collect these, uh, uh, the residual income that comes from it. You know? And then to, to follow up on that, uh, if, if I'm a young producer, and this this situation comes up a lot, balancing having catalog versus uh, having opportunities, right? So I know we work together on a deal, and it's like I don't want to do that, right? Like, yeah, what's that balance of being a creator where you have this one thing and it's generating X amount of money, and then someone wants to buy that thing, but there is a difference in opinion of how much is worth. How do you think about? you know, that as a creator and like deciding, wait, I'm going to keep this in my catalog and keep it making money yeah. or, you know, I'm going to sell, I'm going to sell this because I know there may be a greater opportunity with this artist or artists like them. Yeah. So when you reach mm -hmm. the point where you've got to consider the, the opportunity cost of, of, um, you know, that the decision that you're going to make, it's, that's when you have to start doing some analyzing and thinking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, would would it be worth you know selling this beat or uh, whatever I've made for 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 more upfront money, or um, uh, would it be worth just keeping and uh, keeping it for licensing? Um, but you know sometimes it's not always about the money. You know if an artist goes mm -hmm. if, if you've made sales like previously on that beat and you've made your money on that beat, but then someone comes along with who's you know pretty decent and they want the beat and that can give you more exposure or publishing, um, then you got to think about that as well. Uh, so it really depends on uh, what you want to do and who the other party is. Yeah. So I'm going to try to read between the lines a little bit. Have you had to, you know, turn down some like bigger labels that were trying to like acquire a beat from you, but you couldn't justify it because of how much recurring income from the non-exclusive licensing. Is that, is that, has that situation already happened? In your yeah. Career? Yeah. Uh, there's been a couple of times with, um, independent labels wanted to buy this beat that they just found on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I always realized that these beats have made, um, you know, sell a lot of sales before. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder why, like why, why they would even want to, like buy the purchase well, I don't the think they probably know, right? They probably don't know the history, the historical yeah. context of like how much of your that catalog beat is is worth to you, you know? Yeah. So, um, but that's when uh, kind of I ask as uh, people like Kyle, <laughs> uh, you know, what you know, what should I do? Should I sell it exclusively, non exclusively, yeah. and then um, yeah, go from there. How many beats do you have your in your catalog now? Only like three, just a little over three hundred and fifty. That's a lot. That's it a is. Lot. Yeah. I've seen people do over like a thousand. Yeah. So it makes me feel like I need to put more work. Yeah. I don't, I don't think so, man. I mean, I, you know, you, you know, we talk about quality over quantity all the time, mm. you know, is, is your, um, release schedule like a, how many beats a week do you drop? Um, well, as of the last two years, I haven't really dropped much. No, uh, no, uh, I've been on a, bit of a break um for for personal reasons but mm -hmm. when i was dropping um music or uploading beats to youtube and beat stars it would be about maybe three four times a week at most yeah. yeah yeah but you still have like you still have beats i still find in the charts i still find them like all over the place oh really i haven't been yeah i, I mean noticed. there's yeah. there's some there's some beats that like really like defy the norm. Like you have, you have some beats that, you know, um, that just are like anomalies, you know, they, they last forever. And mm -hmm. probably some of your top earning, you know, income streams is just 
coming from, you know, really few top hit beats, you know, yeah. when you think about um, which, which one of those beats kind of like defy the norm, what are those beats? And can you tell a little bit of a story, any, any stories behind like the creation of some of those ones that are just anomaly kind of tracks that just keep going and going and going? Yeah, uh, I think I've got um, three, I'd say my top three selling beats are um, the called uh, Cream, Roses, and berry, yeah. So it's completely random names. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time to do with food. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows why? But it's short and snappy. You know, one yeah. syllable kind of thing. Um, but um, uh, sorry, what was the question? Yeah, I was just saying like those 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 three beats. Basically, what's the story behind them? Did you know? Did you know those three? I mean, I hear cream all the time. I yeah, hear right. berry all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's still on rotation some of these some of these beats have been out for for years and yeah, they have. they're yeah. still like probably some of your you know top income earners you know yeah uh, i don't think you're ever selling those beats exclusively to anybody it's too late <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no i wouldn't um it wouldn't be worth me selling and it wouldn't be worth them having based on how how many times it's been licensed yeah um story but, behind them yeah tell me yeah, what story yeah. behind. um no i just i remember making because roses mm -hmm. i made in like an hour at a coffee shop mm. but it ended up becoming quite uh popular um i think based on how simple it is um but also kind of how upbeat and happy it sounds mm -hmm. but then some uh, a beat like cream mm -hmm. i spent like four days on right so in fl if you go to i think the project info you mm -hmm. can actually see the amount of time that you spent on right. a project that's something crazy like four days f yeah four days 14 hours, I don't yeah. know, yeah, something crazy, yeah. When you, when you see that kind of reaction, you know, from just like one of those tracks, you know, from artists all over the world, um, how does that make you feel? Um, I like it, like, that's what I produce for. Like, I like it when um, I can see different takes from a lot of independent artists using yeah. this beat. Um, which might not be the best thing because it's, I understand why people don't want to license the same beat, mm -hmm. but um, that that's what I like to see different takes from different artists and how they um, interpret the beat. Themselves. You know, I have another like conspiracy theory on why your, your music it does so well. Okay. So we live in this, we live in this world, you know, social media news, instant kind of like, flood of information that's available to us all the time. And 99% of the emotion and feeling that we're getting from the things that we're exposed from is dark and sad. Mm. And a lot of the music that comes out has those same undertones because popular music makes music for how the population is feeling. Mm. And yeah. it's how people can kind of like in instantly connect with someone going through something. Mm. But I feel like these social media platforms program us and condition us to only explore these type of like dark, sad, hopeless, helpless type of feelings that really sometimes eliminate our gratitude and and just our thankfulness for life. And, and, and it, it also suppresses our ability to be happy and joyful and, and like, remember what those feelings used to feel like, cause we just mm. not exposed to them. Yeah. But when people listen to your music, which is the polar opposite feeling emotion, then most, you know, most, most, most of the music that's on beat stars or the charts on, Spotify or whatever it is, it's like a breath of fresh air. Mm. It's like a breath of fresh air. And it's, um, it's a, it's, it's inspiring other people to like explore different, different, like different feelings of gratitude and different feelings of thankfulness. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So my conspiracy is you're tapping into an inner, like an inner feeling that people really, really want to feel that when they're exposed to it, just like, just like when we spend a whole day away from our devices and our phones and we're just like 
having, you know, real life conversations or real life moments with our family members. You're like, damn, wow. You just remember how yeah. precious and you just remember how, you know, how in the moment, like these, 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 these moments feel and how important they are. Right. So I, I feel like, I don't know if, you know, you're a psychology major or whatever it is, but you've, I think you've accidentally tapped into, um, an emotion for people to explore a more positive light in their life. Mm -hmm. And so they go to you for that. And because there's not a really large supply of that, because we're conditioned to make dark sounding music all yeah. the time, um, you're, you're feeding an audience of people that are just seeking, you know, that feeling. Mm -hmm. I just want to add to that too. And just, you know, give you your flowers while we're here is like, um, there are a lot of people that I notice like sell a lot like on the platform, and then there's like there's also this uh, this this other group too that's like they sell a lot on the platform, but they get like placements, right? And they get like sync, like people reaching out to them for sync, and just like what Abe said, it's like you're giving not only like consumers or or music listeners or music lovers like a feeling, or artists that's buying your beats, but like labels are looking for that new thing. Music supervisors, I know we talked about, and we can touch on that a little bit later, but music supervisors are looking for something new, right? They want, when they're pushing out a commercial or they're pushing out a movie or a TV show or something, they want something that's unique for what they're trying to convey, but also for their audiences. Mm -hmm. And you do a really, really great job of that. And I think uniqueness is going to always continue to win. That's one of the themes that I've heard since we've been at you know, ADE, like that one, that if, if I just had to take away one word um, from this entire experience, it's just about being unique. Um, and I think a lot of creators, like young creators, it's it's so easy to come in to what you do and, and try to like be like someone else because they have a certain level of success or every everybody else wants to be like them. But just from my lawyerly eyes, the, the creators that I see winning, the ones that are doing the deals and getting things closed and they're the unique ones. So mm. I just want to let you know that. Wow, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Means a lot. Oh yeah, man. I'll go on these stars and just search happy or chill or just, you know, yeah. on and just while I'm working and it'll be all GC beats. <laughs> it'll, it'll be all, all GC beats. I, I noticed more people are jumping on the, yeah. this whole um, I think so. sound. Yeah. Um, and they have that. There's been people I think before TikTok me has helped with that, that right? Have, yeah. But there's been people before me that have done these kind of mm -hmm. uh, happy and chill, right. lo-fi, just like positive vibes beats kind of thing. Um, I feel like Mantra was one of those guys, right? That had Ma a lot yeah, of that. he's always been yeah. doing the, the same thing that he's been doing. Um, yeah. It's good. No, it's great, man. We need it. We need to need that balance. You know what I mean? Mm. We need that balance psychologically. We need we need the balance. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we need that escape too sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? And you know, we need artists being able to, you know, share, share some positive shit too. Like, you know what I mean? So they need to inspire them to make that kind of music. So keep doing that. There's not a lot of people doing it. So, you know, that's, that's going to always just differentiate you in the game, you know? Thanks, man. But when you say, Kyle, when you're talking about like just unique, I think I made a mistake by saying unique, like in terms of that's what people need to be. It's, it's not, I don't think it's about being fully unique. I think it's about, you know, I think it's about, familiar familiarity is good you know familiarity is good going back in time in different eras and different 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 genres of music and capturing that but doing it better it's not about unique it's it's about doing it better than what previous creators have done you know because people still need we we have that innate feeling like when we hear something familiar like oh shit, i remember that i remember that i remember that feeling i remember that oh that yeah. sounds like this it sounds mm -hmm. like but this sounds better this sounds different yeah it is it is different but it's it's you know having having that capacity to like understand what are the what are the elements that people are um familiar with but mm -hmm. then also throwing in your own your own signature to make it you you know yeah is is, yeah. A, is a good balance I think, but I think the common theme is what, what you're talking about, GC, is just whatever I feel at that moment, you know, mm -hmm. whatever I feel at that moment. But it's a culmination of everything that you experienced prior to that moment. So even though you're saying it, I'm making whatever I feel at that moment, yeah, but you've been listening to music for the last 30 years, 20, how old, you know, how old you are, but you've been listening yeah. to music, you're influenced by, 
you know, your immigrant parents that we were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Influenced by your yeah. immigrant parents and yeah. their their country's music. You were, yeah. we were talking about how you you've, you used to listen to music from Hong Kong and yeah. folk music and things yeah. like that. T touch a little bit on that, man. Like, you know, because yeah. I think a lot of people are fucking uncultured, man. They got to like go back and they got to they got to check out other other countries music because there's yeah. some sick shit out there, man. Yeah. And well, um, how how's that music kind of influenced you? Um, well, with this sort of like ethnic music, mm -hmm. um, I think more and more producers are finding like crate digging and oh, yeah. especially old Japanese samples and right. they use that as melodies in their beats and just put like trap drums over and it sounds fire. Um, but um, yeah, I grew up with uh, Cantonese music. Mm -hmm. um, but remember the story I was telling you about mm -hmm. with my dad yeah. dropping me off at school? Yeah. <laughs> So I just let everyone in the room though. Basically, um, every morning he'd take me to school. Um, and as soon as we get to the gate of the school, he'd turn up this, what the cassette playing like this really loud, like Chinese, like local, like folk, folk singer from like some obscure village in China. <laughs> and like, it was sound really like, I don't know. It was really embarrassing for me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but like, as he'd do it as soon as I'd open the door and he'd be like, he'd just look at me and he'd just be like, <laughs> like, yeah, like <laughs> I'm like, why do you have to do that? To but um, yeah, uh, but looking back now, I actually appreciate that type of music. You know, it's, it's interesting to hear how um, uh, different melodies and uh, or even like, like geographical location plays a big part in music. Yeah. Um, you can get influence from everywhere, anywhere and everywhere. And it's important that you keep an open mind and just keep on discovering um, music from all different locations. For yeah. sure, man. There's beautiful music everywhere. Mm -hmm. Different instruments, different um, kind of like chord progressions and patterns of how, how you know, how music is, yeah. is made in different different places around the world. They, they have different scales. Yeah, exactly. Different scales yeah. that you can implement that are like, oh shit, that's totally different. Like we we, we know, we know like, tapping into um, different cultures and merging that and mesh and, you know, f fusing that with modern music is, has always been super cool. I think, yeah. I think. You never yeah. know what comes next. Like uh, what can, you know, things that people haven't heard before could be like on the charts and like, it could be make it in the club and you know, it'll be like the next big sound. Yeah. So um, yeah. do you do a lot of collaboration in person, like with other producers or you or, or virtually even, or like, is yeah. there, do you do a lot of collabs or, or uh, no? I yeah. don't mind doing, uh, I do collabs. Okay. I don't mind doing them online. I don't like working with other people mm -hmm. um, in terms of like going to the studio. Right. I've been to a couple of studio sessions, but they just weren't my, yeah. they weren't for me. Um, Why do you think? I work very independently. Mm -hmm. I like to have total like artistic license and mm. creative control over what I'm making. But um, it's not that I don't value the opinions of others. You know, I highly value what other people can bring to the table when it's like a collaborate, like true collaboration between me and another producer. Right. But when it comes to say being in the studio, I've dealt with like, I've dealt with egos a mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your presence would, be taken as a threat for no, well, not a threat, but right. you'd be like, there would be a lot of hostility, mm -hmm. especially if it's like someone else's studio mm -hmm. or it's like mm -hmm. some guy that has, you know, he's, you know, quite accomplished. Right. Sometimes your presence could be taken as right. you know, a threat or like you'd be just seen as like some sort of outsider. And I don't really deal well with that kind of um, energy. You know, it depends, egos it depends and, well, on the collaborator, yeah. right? It just it depends does. on the, on the artist or the producer that you're working with. You know, yeah. I don't think everyone, you know, is going to feel threatened. Some, the, like really, really great musicians. If they s recognize another great musician, like they're going to want to open up yeah. to that person. You know, it's well, it's more like, it's not like that. I'm a, I'm a threat to them. It's, it's like, you know, I don't know you, but like, um, I've got all these like a complete like accolades under right, my belt. So, right. uh, yeah, you take a backseat and just like, you, you know, should walk around with your PayPal statement this. on your head like this. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, really be mad. I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they'll shut up. <laughs> but, but, um, um yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it could be intimidating to be yeah. in a studio and then like having to create on the spot sometimes too is kind of weird. It's kind of yeah. weird sometimes, but yeah. Someone let's let's bring up you know a collaborator that you've worked with a lot recently is Coda the friend right you've made yeah. a shit ton of music with him mm -hmm. um, and 
mostly just you just sending sending beats to him, right? Yeah, it's uh, so he, I think he found me on you. He just found me on YouTube, mm -hmm. and uh, he I think, believe he got a, in contact with you, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when we sent beats over for his yeah one of his uh, lyrics to go EPs. Mm -hmm. Um, but he, I'd say he'd be one of my main uh, collaborators uh, as an artist. Yeah, um, I love working with him. Uh, he's very, very independent. Well, he's he's not signed to a label or anything. So, right. but so he knows exactly what he wants. Um, but he's he's a guy that just makes content consistently, yeah. and uh, found that my beats were a perfect fit for uh, his uh, EPs at the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a total misconception, I think, like in the industry where, like you said, oh, you have to lock in the studio with this artist. You got this is the best way to make music. I, I don't fucking believe so. I don't believe so at all, actually. Yeah. I don't believe so at all. And I'll give you proof. I was just at Austin City Limits um, at this huge, the biggest music festival in Austin, in, 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 in America. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing uh, David, D4VD, you know, D D David, who, who uh, has the hit songs romantic homicide and here with me right mm -hmm. like massive hit song billboard hits right mm -hmm. crazy hit billboard hits that he bought on b stars from dan dan dameran now i'm sitting there throughout his whole set and not to knock the other producers he's been locking in with or like the sessions he's been with you know with with the majors i mean it's, it's all great music but nothing compared nothing compared to his whole catalog of performances than those two hits that he found beats online with mm -hmm. that he he discovered and downloaded and, you know, created those hits in, in solitude. I don't like, I really don't believe that you are more likely to make a hit in the studio than just crate digging on beat stars, finding a vibe or, or piece of music that really that you resonate with that you're feeling at that moment. That's this is a story you want to tell at that moment. Mm -hmm. Right. And releasing that at that moment, there's, there's, you can't, I don't think you can accelerate that process you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. like if i'm locked in with one producer and i'm stuck to that one producer's like vision of how i should sound and i have to kind of conform my artistry as an art as a recording artist to that one producer i mean you may make some great music i'm you know sure there's been hits made that way but you know in today's world with the amount of catalog of music that's discoverable um i think the probability of making something bigger that'll resonate even stronger would be doing it online to me yeah no i agree yeah, you know so, yeah and i would just add to that too speaking on that those songs um uh, are they at like a billion plus streams yeah. for those two songs yeah. i worked on those deals and it goes back to catalog right when we think about owning catalog like we talked about earlier and having leverage it's amazing when you can see a producer and you can just meet a producer and work with them and talk to them. And people don't realize that that producer owns those beats. Mm. Right. So they didn't have to do a work for hire deal for those for those two beats with 1.4 billion streams. Mm -hmm. What they did was, and I shouldn't be giving out the game, but something that B Stars has B Stars Publishing and B Stars has pioneered, the non-exclusive sample. Right. So right. allowing a producer to say, yeah, I don't want to sell my beat to you because it's doing this. He's another one. I only make a certain, I don't make a thousand beats, right? I make a, I make, it's quality over quantity. I make what I like, but I don't want to sell, you know, not my soul, but all my rights to you. This is what I want to do. And then using that leverage to turn around and have another deal with a song that he went number one on Spotify and do that one on exclusively and having a fixed option, right? To say, I'll sell it to you or for hire at this price if I feel like it. And I think the online the online game has has really unlocked a lot of the leverage mm -hmm. for a lot of producers. And if I was a young creator, knowing what I what I know, I probably would have tried to be a, a producer because it's you have so much leverage when you build that catalog, mm -hmm. when you um, know what's going on, when you understand finance, uh, and you just you kind of stick to what you you enjoy. And and I think, like you said, Abe, the online thing is. Uh, it's truly amazing. Some of the it's, stories. It's liberating, man. For real. Not just because I made it. It's just, you know, the nature of the game. And it was going to be done. You know, it was right. going to happen. And um, the online community of collaboration just continues to grow and grow. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, every, every week we we're seeing new billboard, you know, billboard hits coming, yeah. coming, coming from off the platform into, into the hits for the community. I'm so fucking excited, man. It's just yeah. like, great. It's like the dream that we, you know, we had when we started. That this was thing. your goal as a visionary. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was like, man, we're going to unlock this shit. Yeah. We're going to break the whole system. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Give all the producers all the leverage, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we really, when when Kyle says, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that we do that have been done throughout the years that a lot of producers don't know. Like producers, when they used to sign a publishing deal, they used to sign long-term, um, they used to sign. So even, even their online sales were taken by the publishers back in the day. Like they were signing everything over to a publisher. And we were the first like company to kind of force the publishers to carve out you know, online licensing revenue from publishing deals. So producers can continue to maintain mm -hmm. and build their own independent business without everybody all up in their pockets and shit. It's amazing. Yeah. So to me, that, that was like a big, a big win. That was a big win to change, mm -hmm. change the game. But man, back to like, you know, when I first started the podcast, I said, you're one of the top selling in the world ever in the history of the internet. You know, right? Like, like, <laughs> I don't know what to say when you say that sometimes. Yeah, Straight yeah. out of Liverpool. I always just say I, I got I got lucky. Yeah. Man, shut yeah. up, man. <laughs> shut up. Got lucky. Got lucky. Nah, man. Like you were you were blessed. You were blessed, mm. man. You're you know you one of the ones one of the ones that got touched with the ability to have a you know a brain to put it all together and um and create this magic and this and for millions of other artists to like express themselves, man. It's like it's such a blessing, you know, would you be willing to kind of share what, like what you've done throughout your career in terms of revenues? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I remember saying to you, like, cause I'm off, um, I don't know if we we're going to talk about the to touch on this topic, but I was off social media. I don't share a lot on social media. Yeah. I'm quite private with, you know, what's going on in, with the career with my career and my personal life but um for reasons being that i have a lot of family and friends uh, well friends i don't mind seeing you know my you know parts of my life from time to time but like there's a lot of, i don't know it's just something about and i'm not knocking my family it's just like some the certain it's people private. that i'm it's you know private information you're about to get some loan requests after but, this <laughs> <laughs> man um yeah but so <sighs> But now that I, I don't, I really don't mind sharing kind of like the, the metrics and the numbers. Um, uh, I think beat sales from like, uh, licensing, publishing, um, yeah. So wait on distro kid, if you, if, what are those? No, master royalties. Master, yeah, master, master yeah, royalties. Yeah. 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 Cause um, there's a couple of songs that I have 50% on, which okay. I shouldn't really have 50%. Uh, I think the artist's manager is quite um, annoyed at that fact, but um, yeah, those. I want to touch on that topic after though, but go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, sales from before I went full time making beats on BeatStars. I think we're touching on uh, about $2 million amazing yeah. man it's crazy ah. damn dog you make more money than me <laughs> that's amazing let me hold this one now <laughs> congrats man congrats. thanks the only reason why yeah. I, I i even like bring that up it's just you get so many people that have like you know a misconception like oh man you're selling your beats for 30 dollars a license online you're devaluing the game but I'm pretty sure some of those beats alone have generated six figures you know some of those beats by themselves have mm -hmm. right yeah. And yeah. publishing's really added to that as well. So ever since we've done the Sony and BeatStars publishing um partnership, uh that's unlocked another stream of income. Yeah, that's gonna continue to grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have we have plans to like even unlock that even more for producers. So mm -hmm. that's gonna probably eventually turn into one of your big primary revenue streams at mm -hmm. some point within yeah. the next twelve to twenty four months, you know. Yeah. Definitely a keeper. Yeah. That's great, man. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's really inspiring, you know, congrats on all, all of that success. And I think for any young creator, that's, I mean, how old are you? 30 going on to 32. Yeah, man. You're still young, man. Still young. And I don't feel it, <laughs> man. I didn't pay my first paycheck at BeatStars till I was like 35, maybe 36. Oh, wow. So just to show you how ahead of the game you are in building your own business and being a solo entrepreneur 
and not having to rely on employees or contractors or anyone to help to help you grow and scale your business. You're able to do it alone in your own comfort of your home and at your own creative pace is, man, it's a blessing. Mm, it's a blessing. It really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think this is all going next, man? Like, where do you, like, I know you say you're taking, taking a little break. Um, I saw you. Yeah. I remember you posting something about like taking a break and I remember I had to message you. I'm like, GC, man, I'm telling you, man, not a lot of people get this opportunity. Not a yes, lot of people, yeah, I not a lot. I mean, people would kill to be in your position in, yeah. and, um, you know, hopefully you overcome whatever it is that, you know, you're going through personally and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. pray for that. And, and, um, and, and I pray that you will, you know, have some sort some sort of new spark of creativity that, because your music is so damn important to these kids, man, to these people that just mm. like are writing their life stories on your, on your beats. Like you're, I'm, I hate to say it to you, like big bro, you're kind of robbing these, these, these kids of being able to express themselves right now. So <sighs> you, you, you owe it to the community and I hope we get you back soon going, uh, going hard and full time. And I can't wait to hear like the next shit that you, you come out with. So. Yeah, we'll see what I can come up with. Um, I think I've only just got back into the swing of things. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm excited to to put, put out some new work. Oh yeah, man. Any any kind of like last words for you know for the community for the people that follow you? Um, uh, it's been a great journey on Beat Stars. Uh, it's been really fun uh, just meeting uh, all these producers and artists, and uh, yeah, to everyone, just keep up what you're doing. Uh, let's collaborate more. Let's uh, let's let's talk more. Let's share our experiences more, and um, same with artists as well. Let's all let's all keep going. Kyle, uh, I just again giving you your flowers, man. You really really inspire not only you know other creators but people like myself. You know, because it's like when you got a heavy hitter, you got to make sure you're on your A game. So, you know, I would just say you know that number he just said. Let that be a lesson to everyone watching this that as a creator having ownership having catalog having masters having um, publishing all of those things are very important so you can you know build a nice life for yourself and yeah man just excited for you and your, the next parts of your journey and always here to you know help you and be a part of that thanks kyle i appreciate that yeah thank man. you very you, much you inspire the whole generation bro we're so thankful to you, thankful to you to be having us be part of your journey and you know be part of this community you're a motherfucking legend, dog. You uh, motherfucking legend, I appreciate GC. It. And, you too, Abe. And, yeah. um, Feelings mutual. Yes, sir. And um, yeah, I can't wait to see what else you got cooking up. This this is just. I think I feel like you're just getting started. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. How far we can take it. Sky's the limit. Well, that's the that's a wrap for Pay the Creators episode in Amsterdam Part Two at ADE with GC Beats. I thank you everyone for tuning in. Make sure you motherfucking subscribe to the channel, please, and um, keep this thing going so we can keep sharing these amazing stories. Big shout out to Kyle and Lee earlier for you being my my co-host. They auditioned. I think I think they did a pretty good job. We might need to keep them around. I <laughs> 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 right, appreciate y'all. Peace. Peace. Peace.